You are listening to the Daily Gold Podcast, covering precious metals, the junior mining sector, and global capital markets for intelligent investors. Now, here is your host, Jordan Roy Byrne. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Daily Gold Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am really pleased to have with me my next guest. He is Gary Tanashian. He is the editor and publisher of notes from the rabbit hole.com. Uh, that is N F T R H dot com. And you know what I like about Gary's work? Well, I really love his work. Um, nobody knows more about the fundamentals of gold mining and gold stocks more than Gary. And uh, Gary, there's so many questions that I have for you, but first let's start off with, you know, something you were saying about um, how there's a, there seems to be, uh, uh, there, there could be a sentiment shift going on, or at least not yet. It's something that could happen. You were talking about people talking about the uh, the ASIC in the cost in gold. I know you've been you've been trying to make these points about inflation for the miners. Um, I, I don't know if 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 uh, if I if I'm asking a good question here, but maybe you could unpack some of those words into uh, the point you want to get across. Mm, word salad into something coherent. Um, okay, so just on Twitter today, uh, I got feedback about the all-in sustaining costs, and I realized that I have gotten the same input consistently since uh, gold mining investors became aware that inflation was uh, not so surprisingly working against the fundamentals of gold mining operations and um, so now it seems like everybody's fully aware that the the massive inflation that we've had since 2020 is impairing the gold mining industry. And, um, you know, you, you so often hear about how poorly HUI or GDX are performing versus the price of gold. And the theme I'm getting in some comments and some input is that they just expect that to extrapolate forward endlessly. And <clears throat> over the last 20 years, I have never hesitated to be cautious on gold stocks, not bullish on gold stocks, bearish on gold stocks, whatever was needed at the time, if the fundamentals weren't right. And I feel like there are just not many people paying attention to the proper fundamentals now when I believe there's a good chance that bullishness is warranted versus all those years when so often bullishness was not warranted. They didn't listen to me back then when they wanted to be bullish because of inflation or other uh, cockamamie sort of rationale. And I hope this is true, that they're not really listening now either. You know, the, the inflation story and the, the corrosive effects on gold mining seem to be codified and firmly embedded in the average would-be gold bugs uh, mindset right now. And that's a positive thing. It's like you were mentioning earlier before we started, um, that kind of thing could be the fuel for a real sentiment uh, situation whenever gold does decide to break out. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, what's really interesting, Gary, and uh, you know, I, I like to also talk about the top line of the equation, where uh, if you look at the gold price right now, I mean, yes, it's kind of breaking away from the 2011 peak, but you know, yeah. uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, you could say the gold price it hadn't made a new all-time high, or at least broken away. I mean, in my opinion, it's been in a secular bear up until this point. So. Um, but even Gary, even though the gold price is now starting to break away, I mean, we're on the cusp of a epic breakout, in my opinion. That's my word. I mean, there's a little bit of promotion in there at the same time. But it, Gary, it seems like even though the gold price is now really starting to break away, that isn't shifting the negative sentiment on uh, gold miners. No, it's not. And that's what the training has been. You know, I think that gold bugs finally learned their lesson to stop listening to uh, inflation touts as any kind of a right-headed rationale for investing in gold stocks. Because it became, I guess, within the sector, at least, it became front page news that 
the uh, inflation situation in 2021 or late 2020 into 21 and 22 ate away at the bottom lines. I mean, the gold miners themselves were were using that in their uh, quarterly releases, you know. So now people believe it. And now they're on that codified um, thought process rather than looking ahead and looking at the macro and the indicators that just might imply things are different now going forward than they were over the last 20 years. So it's a complicated subject, but it really it's so simple in its bottom line. You know, if something changed, then it is different this time. If something on the the, the top down macro changed, then we've got some different uh, landscape out ahead than we've had over the last 20 years. But I think it's human nature, the nature of herds to uh, to keep on thundering forward in the direction they've been going until they get hit over the head in hindsight. You know, just like the inflation gold bugs finally learned, I think in 2021 or so. Right, and and maybe you could uh, clarify this point for us. Um, I mean, there's also a scenario, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, gold stocks or gold is bullish in every scenario. Okay. I'm not trying to be a permeable, but there are some scenarios where you, you know, you do get inflation rising, but it's more stagflationary and that's more bullish for gold than, you know, gold is outpacing the rise in inflation. Um, I, I mean, is it possible we could also see that scenario occasionally or periodically in the future? Well, I'd be talking theoretically because I don't believe I've uh, functionally been through a stagflation or at least was not paying attention to uh, financial markets in my younger years uh, if there were stagflationary pressures back in the 70s or whatever. Um, So I would just say whatever impairs the economy, whatever impairs investor confidence, so if stagflation is going to drop uh, economic signals and thereby drop certain cost input commodities, obviously like uh, energy commodities that feed into gold mining costs. Um, If it's going to drop materials, uh, human labor, you name it, um, and gold is going up, and certain other, uh, I guess, precious resources, whether you'd call oil a precious resource or not, are going up. I'm not really I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on stagflation. Maybe we should ask uh, Ludwig von Mises about that. But um, I would say that as long as the positively correlated stuff, the happy stuff, as I would call it, as that as long as that is failing in terms of gold, as opposed to in terms of dollars, then uh, I would say, you know, the gold miners theoretically could do well in that situation. Uh, it's the economic backdrop. It's the psychology of investors where positive or negative financial markets are concerned. And it, it's the cost input commodities feeding directly into gold mining bottom lines that would would matter in that situation. But again, I'm no expert on stagflation. So that's the caveat. I want to get your thoughts on silver. I know we've talked about it in the past, and you, I, I think you look at it more of an indicator than a, a pure market. Um, but how, it seems like based on your analysis, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but silver can be in this tug of war where, to me, it's really, given the way it's traded recently, it, it's more of a precious metal, in my opinion, than an industrial metal. But it would seem to me you have this tug of war where you know the industrial side, silver, is – a little bit more correlated to, you know, copper and the positively correlated stuff, as you say. Then at the same time, it, um, you know, it, it seems like it's gold's little brother. I mean, to me, it, at least in the last five, six, seven years or so, it's been acting more as a precious metal than industrial metal. But how do you look at silver and where does that come into play for you, well, given your your it, fundamental, you know, explanation of gold and all, all right. these things? Well, in this phase, it topped out when gold did pretty much right in the mid mid 2020 so in topping out and correcting for the last couple of years it it is acting like a precious metal 
which I find really interesting, um, it, it didn't participate in the inflation trades. And so that makes me um, not coincidentally less cautious on silver now, it, even if I'm expecting uh, the disinflation uh, phase to continue and eventually morph deflationary. But I do think silver will be weaker than gold if you know, if the shit hits the fan, so to speak, I think that, um, you know, gold is the go to that situation. But silver has been acting like a uh, precious metal and it's caught situation. Commitments of traders is better than gold's right now or it looks like it has more upside. Uh, and there are times that silver leads the, the whole precious metals complex, and that's a possibility right now based on a couple different ways of looking at it. Uh, again, the, uh, the fact that it has been a precious metal for the last couple of years and that its commitments of traders is, is looking pretty decent. So I'm willing to look at silver whichever way it wants to be viewed, you know, and right now it, it's, uh, it's wearing its precious metals outfit. So then not to put words in your mouth, but then you would, you know, given your how bullish you are on gold, then you would have to be bullish on silver as well. Yes, am and have been. However, I think when the, the silver gold ratio blows off, it's going to signal the end of uh, the broad market rallies. I mean, roughly, it's not like to the day or anything, but when that thing blows out, I'd be super cautious on commodities. Uh, I be expecting the bear market to resume in stocks. And this this bear market rally hasn't finished its job yet. You know, I've been talking for months about uh, this thing, the Q4, Q1 rally now into Q2. And it's here to fix the bear bearish mindset out there. You know, it's here to, um, you know, reconstitute the FOMOs and, and get the happy stuff going again. But when silver tops out, against gold i'd be cautious on not cautious i'd be bearish on all that stuff and i'd also be preparing for the first uh significant correction in the precious metals complex as well so then it, yeah because i wanted to ask you about this um you know, thanks for giving me a transition so do you view the precious metals market like bob hoy does where um, what, ha what happens when, um, you know, you're in a bear market for the stock market, but you're in a bull market for precious metals. When the stock market's going up, precious metals will, you know, really outperform those rallies. And then when the market rolls over and has a new leg down, then precious metals will also go down, but maybe, you know, silver will go down the m most, the stocks will get hit, but gold won't go down that much. I mean, I guess I'm, you know, putting words in, you know, in Bob Hoy's mouth. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, is that kind of the setup that you could be roughly we could be looking at for later this year? Yeah, roughly. I think so. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a very logical setup because the bugs are going to sell um, because it's not it's not like the most uh, purely knowledgeable investor base on the planet. I mean, I know this for a fact. I mean, people get really hyped up. They jump on that sector FOMOs like uh, like none other, I think. And perceptions get cemented and it needs to be corrected. And especially when silver is leading, that's that's indicating that this thing is a bullish and b heading for a peak in that bullishness. But I just think it's going to be a temporary peak. And there is one more uh, probably pretty significant buying opportunity out there ahead as as the macro shifts from this Goldilocks to something worse, you know. And, you know, Hoy is, is definitely an influence of mine. I've mentioned that a lot in public writing. The only difference is, um, you know, I had to wait to see the evidence in the indicators of a uh, post-bubble contraction, which is Bob Hoy's term, and I fully agree with it. It makes sense to me. It has made sense to me for, for you know, 
what is it, 15 years since I've known of him. And he's the one I uh, kind of gravitated to early on. But I'm not going to see a post-bubble contraction until the indicators show it to me. That's the difference. <laughs> so, you know, 2008, that crash was glorious. The recovery was great. And then the inflation started. The bubble did not end. 2020, same thing, right? So the, the difference now is I'm finally seeing a potential real post long-term bubble contraction that will long-term sustain the bottom lines of the gold mining industry, I believe, if things stay on track as they have been over the last few months. So it comes down to, is the Fed able or willing to jump back into action and inflate? Because inflation is ultimately the thing, or at least a major component of what has foiled the gold stock, gold mining investment case routinely every time, which is why gold bugs hate gold stocks now, you know, and why they, they moan about GDX underperforming gold, uh, because it was warranted and fundamentally uh, the right thing. So I'm going full frontal Bob Hoy if this is really the post-bubble contraction. That's my short answer. How much more, I, I, I guess it's kind of a, a similar question for precious metals versus stock market, but let, just let me stick with precious metals. How much this move that we've had, I mean, we could all call it the start of a bull market in precious metals. I mean, I guess if you or other people don't want to go there, think about it as a rebound. How much more upside could this move have before precious metals are you know, impacted by a stock market, which begins another bear market leg to the downside. Um, and let me, we were just talking about like, could could silver go above 2728? That's like a follow up to that. Um, I, was it in last week's report, Jordan, or the one before? Um, can't quite remember. There's a couple targets for silver and um, <clears throat> the best target I'd like to see was in the 27s, as I recall, 2750, something like that. But, you know, the, it doesn't have to get that high before the next correction, but it's certainly viable. So it's, this, it sounds like this is something that could occur fairly soon then, because silver, what, silver's trading at the 25s today? I mean, I guess percentage-wise, that's decent and upside, but it's right. It, it's, I, I it's pretty clear. If you're looking at monthly and quarterly charts, I mean, that 27, 28 area is pretty significant resistance. Yeah, let me take a look. Well, yeah, I um, now I'm getting myself sidetracked looking at charts here. Uh, men men who stare at charts yeah the man is staring at his chart right now uh, and the chart's not pulling up there it is so yeah i think there's that we wanted to have a thrust to take out that cluster from november november december and into january that there was a topping cluster and silver took that out at 2475 and is now holding that the last few days it it dropped to test 2475 today as you say it's at 2520 um looking good and this is what i wanted this was the bare minimum i wanted on this rally in order to stay bullish for the rally was for it to take out the uh, november highs it's done that tested it and yeah, I think it's looking it's looking at 27 next, and it would be great to make a higher high to the uh, 2022 high of uh, looks like about 27.50 or so. But uh, either way, I think it has set a marker for the future. Um, but I think there's higher to go on on this particular leg, although risk in silver, risk in the miners, and even gold is rising, risk versus reward by definition of the prices. And silver especially has just gone vertical since uh, since early March. So 
you know, there's the short term price management and all that. But what I'm more interested in is the, the 2023 macro. And I want to try to get it right as far as, you know, am I right expecting a broad global bear market resumption, a correction in the precious metals, and then a buying opportunity, and then a more extended post-bubble contraction where the Fed is not what the Fed has been for the last 20 years. And to me, they don't seem anywhere near being that. So everything seems on plan, but we're, I don't believe we're on, on the great leg of the precious metals bull market just yet, although we have started. But okay, let me follow up on the, the I've, Fed. I mean, I many things you didn't even ask, but <laughs> that's, that's what happens when the man stares at charts. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's that's very good. No worries <laughs> on that. But let me follow up on the on the Fed because I mean, you're even even if they try and refuel this. Well, well, let me backtrack for a second. It seems like the you know inflation, as you call it, is going to be promoted in the future by the government and fiscal policy. I mean, some people have said that that's the way it will be, and then the Fed will do what they've kind of been doing now. They'll you know chase inflation by raising interest rates higher, but you know not not being extremely restrictive. Um, so it, I, how did I mean? I don't know if I'm making a rebuttal here or asking a question. No, oh, I, I but um, yeah, I, I I just think that's a huge. I mean, even if you know the, the Fed, you know, they cut rates or they do QE again or whatever. I just think that everything is shifted, and that whatever they do, it's going to have you know the impact is going to be far less successful than it was you know, after the early 2000s, right. after two, after 2009, after COVID. And yet if we get fiscal inflation by, by government policy and you have a Fed that is uh, toothless or unwilling, what kind of inflation will that be? And that kind of squares with what bond yields have done in changing their trends from the last 20 years or more, 20, 30, back to the 1980s. That's that's one of the major trend changes in the indicators that I've seen is those yields broke out and something is different. And maybe maybe that's what it means is that uh, the inflation from here on is going to be legislated by governments. Uh, you know, one, I think, popular uh, view would be the rebuilding of Ukraine and other war torn areas by government decree. Uh, with fiscal policy, and that maybe that's what brings on a stagflation or a, a crack up inflation. You know, uh, right now my my view is, you know, it goes along in quarterly chunks. And right now I'm looking into Q2, obviously, and interested in the second half of 2023, which I think will not be inflationary. But after that. That could be the scenario, like you're saying, with uh, fiscal policy driving inflation, like I think you're saying. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let me get. Let me give you a final question on the stock market. Sure. Uh, so, one thing that I looked at in the last 20, 25 years, all the worst declines. You know, they whether you're in a you're in a secular bear or a secular bull, all the worst declines began in March or May. And we know that, what is it, August or September tends to be a really bad month for the stock market. Um, I mean, not always, but, you know, when you're in a week, when you're not in a secular bull, you know, my words, um, mm -hmm. like, like right now, I mean, that that's when the market can be really vulnerable to a decline in those months. So, I mean, do, do you see this potential decline in the stock market? Is this something that could start after this May? Um, like like immediately after, or could well, the market hang around for a couple more months and then it gets really hit in August and September? So I have two scenarios, and one is um, a gap fill and resistance on the S and P 500, not far from where it is now. Same thing goes for Nasdaq. But there's another scenario, and again, the man stares at his charts, sees weekly chart patterns that look really bullish. 
And so at this point, I just w have not shorted anything and don't want to short anything. Um, we've held the downside parameters that kept us on the uh, the bull market, uh, bear market rally theme, and the market held that by by the hair of its chinny chin chin, and um, it has proceeded upward, and it's just grinding along. But I don't see yet a sentiment climax along with certain upside milestones, and when I see that, then I'm going to, uh, you know, think about at least shorting this market, but. Uh, People should, most people should think about just having cash, possibly treasury bonds for as long as that works and inflation doesn't rear up again. And, um, you know, we're, we're patiently finishing up a bear market rally and it could still go several more weeks into May, into June. Uh, but by the second half of 2023, I'm, I'm going to batten down, be happy for my, uh, whatever gains I have in the first half of the year and um, just prepare to, to realize what the second part of this thing is, which is a resumption of the bear market. Um, but those patterns on the weekly charts, uh, you know, I can't look away and they are bullish. So if they play out that way, they're uh, pretty much inverted head and shoulders. And if they play out that way, we test uh, the 4,700 area on the S&P 500, for example. So it would really gall the bears. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a very bullish sentiment by the, the, the bulls and uh, the happy days are here again crowd. And we're looking for the bears to at least start throwing in some towels. Um, that's what this bear market rally is all about. And then, uh, Less favored, obviously, is that it's it is a new bull market now. The bear is over. Twenty twenty two ended it. I just don't believe that. But uh, if we take out the highs, obviously, I'm wrong on that. So, we'll just see what happens going forward. Right now, it's it's risk management, a little speculation, and personally, personally, I'm not not subscribing to anybody's uh, dogma theorizing uh, bias or anything like that. It's, it's a, a market for an open mind and has been for the last six months. Stay open-minded, wait for parameters, um, and don't do what your, your ego or your guru are telling you to do simply because they are telling it, you know? So it's been a really complicated situation or a, a difficult situation to manage because of the mix of uh, market indicators going haywire out there, the mixes of emotions almost on a daily or weekly basis. But for people like you and me, I think it's also a very rewarding and interesting time across the uh, asset spectrum. Obviously, especially in the precious metals, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. Thank you for tuning into the Daily Gold Podcast. For more interviews, editorials, and analysis, log on to thedailygold.com. And for premium coverage of precious metals and the best junior mining companies, visit thedailygold.com forward slash premium.